Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. And this evening, we're going to take a step back from the news broadcast uh, as I share with you a message that has been plaguing my heart for the last week. I have actually worked on this all through the week. I uh, was prepared to bring it out earlier when I discovered that everything I had worked on had disappeared uh, just really been a battle against Satan to bring this out. And even tonight, uh, I've got eye bothering me really bad and, and all kinds of pains and everything else. It, it's been a fight to get this message put together. Um, right now, we've got a title, New Evidence, Yeshua in the Life of Joseph. You're going to hear things tonight that you've probably never heard before in your life. We're going to be using the book of Genesis, but also a little bit of insights from the book of Jasher, where it goes a little bit deeper into the story itself. Uh, scholars have been divided over the book of Jasher. Uh, we do know it's in the canon spoken of in the book of Joshua, as well as the book of Chronicles as being an authentic book of the Bible. Uh, however, because the Hebrew version that, the, that we have the English translation of was done back in the 1600s, no one knows for sure whether or not this is the actual correct translation or not. And, uh, or not so much translation, but an authentic copy. Well, I always realize not everything is going to be perfect necessarily, but nonetheless, I've been able to discover some amazing facts in the book of Jasher that are even still written in our own canon, word for word, wording back to this particular book. So I think it's at least worthy of being able to quote it in this particular broadcast that I think will be a blessing for you. I do ask you, if you are Jewish, that you will take the time to hear this message from beginning to end. It may just very much touch your heart. If you know someone Jewish, send this message to them and ask them to please listen to every word. It's something that may just rattle their heart to reconsider this man Yeshua to be the Messiah. Let's, let's move along here. It says a lengthy message tonight, so please bear with me. Um, as we go through it, I'll try to go rapidly but I want you to be sure to get it. In Genesis chapter 37, verse 3, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. In Hebrew, it's actually the coat of long sleeves. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than, than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream that he told his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. And for behold, we, are, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheep arose, and all stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood around about and made obeisance to my, my sheaf. In other words, they bowed to his sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance. In other words, they bowed unto him. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? And shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come and to bow ourselves to thee to the earth? Do you realize that this dream has never been fulfilled? Now, some people might would say, especially critics against the Bible, well, it never was fulfilled, so it must not be right. That has nothing to do with it. The story of Joseph is very much a type of the story of Yeshua. It is a compound fulfillment, something you'll see as we go along here. Now, many scholars, by the way, have already pointed out a lot of the similarities between the story of Joseph and Jesus. Uh, they say that, you know, he was sold for 20 pieces of silver, and so was Jesus sold for 30 pieces of silver. The two thieves on the cross, Yeshua prophesied of them. One went to paradise, one ended up in hell. The, two ba the baker and the butler 
One is restored to his position, the other one is hanged. There's so many similarities between the story of Joseph and Yeshua that is very common amongst the Christian believers. But tonight we're going to discuss even more so. Some of those we'll, re re we'll rehearse again. But we're going to look at things that you probably never have considered in all of your life about the story of Joseph. And it may shake the Jewish people to the core to wake up and recognize that perhaps there is something something to this. Maybe Yeshua is indeed the Mashiach. So in verse, 30, verse 11 of chapter 37, his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying, and his brethren went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And said to them, Here am I. And he said unto him, that's Joseph that is, Here am I. And he said to him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out on the vow of, of, of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. Now we know he meets the angel of the Lord along the way, and he's beginning to, the angel of the Lord tells him that they're actually feeding over at Dothan. If you look at the book of Jasher, though, it's actually the Lord himself that he meets. Anyway, as I said to you, though, that particular prophecy right there, Isaiah 45, 23, where he says, uh, this is the part when I say Joseph's dream is an unfulfilled prophecy, but it will fulfill in Yeshua, his brother, so to speak, a type, a perfect type. And we see this in Isaiah 45, 23. I've sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth and shall not return, that not that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear or confess that he is indeed Lord. So Joseph is a type of Yeshua, the greater Joseph. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth, in righteousness shall not, uh, excuse me, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue swear or confess. Now, we know that this applies to Yeshua. That's why I say that Joseph is a type of Yeshua who is the greater Joseph. And this is where that will be fulfilled about his father and his mother and, his, and the 11 brothers will bow before Joseph, the greater Joseph. For it is written, uh, verse, four, verse 11 in Romans chapter 14, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. And Paul, in verse 10, ascribes that to Yeshua. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So that's how we know that. Let's go right back into the story of Joseph here. Genesis chapter 37. Uh, looking at verse 13 first here. Of course, we're going to kind of skip through it to go quickly. And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to him, here, I, here am I. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. Now I want you to notice, if you're able to see the, the, the words on the screen here in the background, when I put it bold and yellow like that, because I normally am going to say something about it. If not in this frame, it'll be some follow-up types that I share with you. All right, and they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into a pit, and we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands, and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is, that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him uh, out of their hands to deliver him to his father again. And it came to pass, when Joseph was come unto his brethren, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him. Now, he, the Hebraic language actually speaks of a coat of long sleeves, but I think even in the Septuagint, it speaks of the coat of uh, many colors. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty, and there was no water in it. Now, as I mentioned to you here, there's a lot of types and shadows in this. And Genesis 37, 18, as we read there, And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. It's exactly what they were doing to Yeshua. Remember where this was. Herod the king 
You know, he was a king of Judah. He was also a, well, they say he converted to Judaism. Some scholars debate whether or not he was actually Jewish, but they do know for a fact that if not, he was not Jewish, they know that he was a descendant of Esau. All right, and Esau was a son of none other than Isaac and Rebekah, and that is a descendant of Abraham. So one of Abraham's own descendants, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. Who was he mocked by? Like I said, the wise men came. They saw his star in the east. They came to worship him. In other words, they See, Herod seen him coming from afar off, and he already knew that the wise men were speaking about the prophecies that there was another king coming, and that was a problem for Herod. So he did something about it early on, trying to get to Yeshua, so he killed every child that there was, and this is exactly what Joseph's brothers were trying to do, trying to stop his visions from coming to pass. All right, so let's move on to another one here, Genesis 37, 20, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Matthew 27, 41, like also the, the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, he saved others himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. In other words, let's see what will happen if he can save himself. All right, the same thing. They're, throwing, they're gonna throw him in the pit and here Yeshua is being thrown into the pit. Let's see what happens to him. Let's see if what his prophecies really say. Because there's another one, remember? They said, you know, I, I destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up again. They said, well, let's see if he does raise it up now. That's exactly, again, amazing things there. Genesis 37, 21, Reuben. This is the one that gets me. And Reuben heard it and he del delivered him out of their hands. Now, and on a website, what is in a name, behindthename.com, meaning and history, we look at the name of Reuben, it means behold a son. In the Hebrew, the Old Testament, he is the eldest son of Jacob and Leah, as we already know this. But Reuben, the reason I bring this out was because every time they said Reuben's name, because Reuben was there fighting for, for Joseph, that no harm come to him. You know, so every time they would say Reuben, they were saying, behold a son, behold a son. I mean, it's like sounding a banner or something, blowing the trumpet if, if, at the very least there. And then, of course, we have the famous one on uh, Genesis 37, 23, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat. And this is exactly what they did to Yeshua as well. Matthew 27, 28, and they stripped him and put him in a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited him with a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him saying, hell, king of the Jews. But you know what gets me is why didn't, why didn't we as a Jewish people recognize him by the crown that he was wearing? I mean, have you ever stopped to think about it? The very crown he was wearing, the, when they put that crown of thorns upon him, do you not realize that the crown of thorns itself, the word thorns or thorn bush in Hebrew is the word Sinai. See, what? let me read to you right here. Name of the month, Mount Sinai, by Jeff and uh, A. Beener, Mount Sinai, See Exodus 19.20, is the mountain that Israel met with God upon leaving Egypt. The Hebrew word Sinai, Strong's Concordance 55.14, means thorn. This word comes from the parent root, uh, sin nun, also meaning thorn. Another word derived from this parent root is sine, which is what you normally hear regarding on that, meaning thorn bush. The bush that Moses saw burning in Exodus 3.2 is sine. All right, it was not just a burning bush, but a burning thorn bush. You know, now I say that, watch, Matthew 27, 29, and when they had plated a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head. Why do I bring this out here? Because when they put that crown on Yeshua, now Yeshua is in the midst of the bush. He is God manifested. In other words, inside of Yeshua was God Almighty, his own life was living inside of him, right? Just like it says uh, uh, in the scripture, you know, that it, it quotes the book of Isaiah there, saying that, uh, speaking about John the Baptist, behold, I send my messenger to prepare the way before the Lord. Do you realize the word Lord there? They only, they put a capital L, little O-R-D, which just must be supposed to mean like Adonai, but if you look at it in Hebrew from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, it actually says, Kol -kore. See, Kol -kore, a voice 
crying out, Bemidba, in the wilderness. Prepare the way for Yahuwah. Preparing the way before Yahweh, as most people say it. All right? And here we have the crown of thorns upon his head, just like when Moses met God at Mount Sinai. Now, it says in the Hebrew there that the angel of his presence, and it was Yahuwah, Yahweh, speaking from the midst of that fire or from the midst of the angel of his presence. Yeshua is the, so to speak, the angel of his presence, not that Yeshua is an angel. In other words, it's the body that God himself is living inside of, reconciling the world unto himself, my Jewish brethren. Do you see that? In other words, when God spoke from the midst of the thorn bush and they put that crown of thorns on Yeshua's head, it was a sign to us that God is in the midst of the bush. And we missed it. How can we miss it? It's just like in the story of Joseph. It was to save life. Oh, this, this is beautiful, friends. Getting, it's going to get very beautiful. So the KGV translation from the Hebrew Masoretic text states this in Genesis 37, 24. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. Speaking about Joseph. There was no water in it, and they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead, and with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh, going down to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And it, and his brethren were content. In other words, they agreed. Okay, let's do that then. Then there passed by the Midianite merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they brought Joseph into Egypt. Now, good brother, wonderful brother, Brother John, good friend of mine there, we, we've talked about this many times before, and he's always corrected me on that. He said, brother, you know, he said, they didn't sell him to the Ishmaelites, they sold him to the Midianites, all right? And, but it's really kind of confusing when you look at this. And I'm going to share with you in just a moment where one account in one chapter says they sold him to the Midianites and another account in the other chapter says they sold him to the Ishmaelites. So the question is, is which one did they sell him to? If you look at the book of Jasher, though, it actually clears up this problem for us. Then we begin to understand really what happens here. So again, let's look at this. Come, let us sell him unto the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him. All right, that's, we know that. Then there passed by Midianite merchantmen, and they drew, lifted up Joseph out of the pit, and sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. Now, Brother John used to say, Steve, the Jewish people never sold him. That was the argument. They never sold him. Because remember, Yeshua was sold by Judas, who was a Jew. Remember, it's Judah that's saying, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. Judas sold for 30 pieces of silver Yeshua over to the high priest. In this case here, and it's kind of interesting because who ends up buying Joseph? See, Poniphar. Poniphar does. Now, Poniphar is an officer of the guard is what he is. I don't know if there's really any bearing on that or not. But so... But the thing is, it looks like the Midianites selling to the Ishmaelites. So whatever happened to the, the, is the children of Israel selling to the Ishmaelites? So it's kind of confusing. And I'm going to prove to you that the scripture actually says they sold him to the Ishmaelites. All right, in just a moment. But first, let's clear up the, what's going on in the story. Let's take a look at the book of Jasher, chapter 42, verses 2 to 5, clearing up the confusion on the King James Version on this. It says, they were holding... Council, when they lifted up their eyes and saw, and behold, there was a company of Ishmaelites coming at a distance and by the road of Gilead going down to Egypt. And Judah said to them, What gain will it be to us if we slay our brother? Just like it says in Genesis, peradventure, God will require him from us. This then uh, is the counsel proposed concerning him, which you shall do unto him. Behold, uh, this company of Ishmaelites going down to Egypt. Now therefore, come let us dispose of him to them, and let not our hand be upon him, and they will lead him along with them, and he will be lost in amongst the people of the land, and we will not put him to death with our own hands. And the proposal pleased his brethren, and they did according to the word of Judah. 
Doesn't that sound the same? Just like the story of Judas, right? Verse 5, And while as they were discour discoursing or discussing about this matter, before the company of Ishmaelites had come up to them, so the Ishmaelites had not got there yet, seven trading men of Midian passed by them. As they passed by, they were thirsty. They lifted up their eyes and saw the pit which Joseph uh, emerged, and they looked, and behold, every species of bird was upon him. I thought that was kind of interesting, too. There's ancient documentation about Yeshua that the birds would just come to him uh, because they felt his peace there about him. Now note, the Midianites draw Joseph out, supposing that he, they have captured a free slave. They actually took him out of the pit. King James brings that out as well. But watch what Joseph, J J Jasher continues on to say here. Now, keep in mind, after the Midianites, they draw him out. This is because I have to skip down to save time. But they draw Joseph out from the pit. They suppose they found a free slave, but Joseph's brothers were not content to let them have him for a free and almost drew blood for uh, Joseph's sake. In other words, they weren't just going to let him up and take him off because they were uh, conspiring to sell him themselves to the Ishmaelites. So they threatened them. In fact, uh, Simon becomes so angry and reminds them of the story of what happened uh, down when his brother, him, and Levi went down there and killed an entire town over their daughter, Tamar. Okay, now they knew that story there, and when they, they got uh, fearful of, these, uh, of, of, of Joseph's uh, brothers there, uh, but anyway, as that went on, then it goes on to say, Surely you have said that the young man is your servant. Because that's what they claim. They didn't say that he was actually their brother. They just said that he was their servant. And he rebelled against you, and therefore you placed him in the pit. Because they'd moved away from the pit. They didn't want to hear him crying. He was crying and weeping and begging them to deliver him out. All right, and, and says, when, they, when we use a servant who rebels against his master, now therefore sell him unto us, and we will give you at, 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 at that you require for him. And the Lord was pleased to do this order that the sons of Jacob should not slay their brother, because God knew that they had intended to kill him. All right, so the Lord kind of allowed all these things to happen, and of course, as we know, for the greater good of Israel down the road. So the Midianites saw that Joseph was a comely appearance and well-favored, and they desired him that their hearts and were urgent to purchase him from his brethren. And the sons of Jacob hearkened to the Midianites, and they sold their brother Joseph to them for 20 pieces of silver. And Reuben, their brother, was not with them, and the Midianites took Joseph and continued their journey to Gilead. All right, so they actually sold him out. All right, now, so, and, and this here, I actually, maybe I, I may have accidentally put this in here in the wrong place there. So anyway, the sons of Jacob hearkened to the men, and they sold their brother Joseph to them, all right? And they were going to, uh, along the road to the Midianites, repented of what they had done. They actually regretted buying him. And having purchased the young man and said one to another, what is this thing that we have done in taking this youth from the Hebrews, who is of comely appearance and well favored? See, perhaps this youth was stolen from the land of the Hebrews. And, and why then have, have we done this thing? If he should be sought for and found in our hands, we shall die uh, through him. Now, surely heart... Uh, heart, hearty and powerful men have sold him to us, and strength of one of whom you saw this day, perhaps they stole him from, this, from his land with their might and with their powerful arm, and have uh, threefold sold him to us the small value which we gave unto them. So they knew that he was being sold way too cheap. And while as they were thus discoursing together, they looked, and behold, a company of Ishmaelites was coming, uh, coming at first, in which the sons of Jacob saw was advancing toward the Midianites. And the Midianites said to each other, Come, let us sell this youth to the company of Ishmaelites who are coming towards us, and we will take for him the little we gave for him, and we delivered from be, or, and be delivered from the evil. So the Midianites ended up selling him to the Ishmaelites, just like the King James Bible says, but, the, uh, the, but his, Joseph's brothers actually sold him to the Midianites first. All right, so... Uh, continuing on here, if you drop down, Joseph wept sorely. Now, after they had bought him, and they're continuing on their way, Joseph really begins to weep uh, over being sold into slavery because he's leaving his home and he's leaving his father. And, you know, this is just becoming too much for him. 
And one of the Ishmaelites rose up and smote Joseph upon the cheek, and still he continued to weep. And Joseph was fatigued in the road and was unable to proceed on the account of the bitterness of his soul. And they all smote him and afflicted him in the road, and they terrified him in order that he might cease from weeping. And the Lord saw the ambition of Joseph in his trouble. All right, now this is the Ishmaelites who already got him. They're taking him down. They're abusing him. And then it says, And the Lord brought down upon these men darkness and confusion. All right, darkness and confusion. And they said to each other, What is this thing that God has done to us? Uh, and they, they knew not that this befell them on the account of Joseph. Does that not remind you of what happened during the time of the Lord? They smote Yeshua as well, right? One of them... The Ishmaelites rose up and smote Joseph. What does it say in Luke 22, 63? And the men that uh, held Jesus mocked him and smote him. See, they smote him and afflicted him on the road. See, uh, and, and when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, prophesy, who is it that smote you? Right? And it doesn't end there. See, and then the Lord brought down... He brings down the darkness. We also know in Matthew, what does it say in Matthew 27? There was darkness over all the land. See, because remember, Joseph, and of course, Joseph goes through beatings more than once. We're going to find that out later. Through the hand of Potiphar, this happens as well, but this, again, is just another type of when Yeshua was being brought out and, and, uh, and just totally uh, mistreated by his own brethren. So, so, Anyway, while Joseph is sold into Egypt, his father is being deceived by his own brethren. Let's go back to Genesis and we'll pick up on this story right here. And then in just a second, we're going to actually look um, um, into that because I thought I'd place this in here about the two places there, uh, the scripture where it speaks about him being sold. And, and, and I don't know. I have to go back and look to see on that. Anyway. Uh, in Genesis 37, 29, And Reuben returned into the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and rent his clothes. And he returned unto his brethren and said, The child is not, and, I, and whither shall I go? And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped, it, dipped the coat in the blood. And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, uh, This have we found. Know now whether this be your son's coat or no. And he knew it, and he said, It is my son's coat, and evil beasts have devoured him. Joseph was without doubt rent in pieces. Now, they, if you notice in the story in Genesis, they were talking about saying that they were going to tell their father that he was torn by a wild beast. But when he's showing the coat, it's Joseph's, his father himself that says that he's torn by a wild beast, no doubt, and, and been rent in pieces. If you read in the book of Jasher, it's a little bit more clear, because in the book of Jasher, they show you just hand it to him and see what he says and let him say it. They didn't want to even lie about that part. They just wanted to let his father say it. And that's the way it really happens. And it's a little bit more clear than what we have here. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. All right? Now, I want to go back, though, to verse 31 in Genesis. And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid, the goat, the goats, and dipped the coat in the blood. Did you notice that? They dip it in the blood. I believe that when we have in the Hebrew calendar, Yom Kippur, normally during the month of September, early October, we call it Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. This is, the, the, as we know from the Levitical law, and I'll read it to you here, but the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. I did a, a video on this couple of years back. And it's something that God had revealed to me that is just completely miraculous. I really believe the whole story of the scapegoat that God put in Levitical law comes from the very story of Joseph. And I know many of you guys, you know that I do believe, as the scripture says, that, 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 uh, that, that God prefers mercy over sacrifice. You know? And, but... I know that God permitted sacrificial system because of the wickedness of the children of Israel from down in Egypt. 
So they set up the, the sacrificial law there. But nonetheless, we get a Levitical law there about the scapegoat. There is one goat that is taken as sacrifice. The other one is set free into the wilderness. And this comes exactly from the story of Joseph's own brethren. Because what did they do? They take and they, they took an innocent little lamb, had done nothing. He had not sinned. And they kill this lamb, murder this lamb, and they put the blood on his coat and they go back to their father and say, tell us if this is your son's coat or no. This is the sacrificial goat where the blood comes before the sight of Almighty God. And when they took their brother and laid their hands on him and threw him into the pit, supposing him to be dead, the Midianites lift him out. See, their hands went upon him and put him into this pit. This is where we get the scapegoat from. Joseph becomes a scapegoat and he bore the sins of his own brethren in his body. And he carries those sins far away from the presence of their father. And their father has no idea what they did. And see, Yeshua, he was both scapegoat and sacrificial lamb. In his own body, they laid their hands upon him and they put him into the hands of the Romans to be crucified. And he took their sins very far away. He was the scapegoat, but yet at the same time, he became the sacrifice unto God to end, to abolish the sacrificial system of 70, uh, finally in 70 AD it, it ended, but remember, he broke open those sacrificial pens that they were selling on the tin, the temple, and he says, my father's house is a house of prayer, and you make it a den of thieves. He loosed all those animals. Did anybody forget that, that he loosed the animals? See, he was the Lamb of God. He was both scapegoat and sacrificial lamb. Just like in the case of Joseph, they killed that goat and put the blood on his coat and handed it to his father. He said, judge ye whether this be your son's coat or no. And Joseph bore their sins in his own body as he sold out as a slave, carrying their sins away to a faraway land. I think it's just beautiful to say the very least here. Notice the confusion continued on the sale of Joseph here. And, and this is why I'd actually put it in this part here. I should have had it backed up a little bit. When you get to Genesis chapter 37, verse 36, note this is where I was talking about the difference here about who did the buying. It says, And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Pontifer and the officer of Pharaoh's and the captain of the guard. Now that's the Midianites sold Joseph to Pontifer. And it says here in Genesis 39, verse 1, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Pontifer, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of a guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. So the question is, is who did Pontifer buy Joseph from? Was it the Midianites or was it the Ishmaelites? It's kind of strange that we actually get the confusion here in Genesis. But as I said, if you look at the book of Jasher, it's cleared up there what happens. And no, you don't have to worry about getting it all mixed up here. The Ishmaelites and the Midianites were both involved. And no, as Brother John always said to me, no, Brother Steve, he said the Jews never sold him. Yes, they did. They sold him to the Midianites. The Midianites sold him to the Ishmaelites, and the Ishmaelites sold him to Pontifer. Now, if you look in the story of Jasher, though, they called the Midianites back to Pontifer in order to clarify that they had purchased him from them because Pontifer questions whether such a goodly man could have been a slave in the first place. Now, this may be the why it says, and the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Pontifer. Okay, maybe that's why they've got it written there. So it, it's just confusing in uh, the, the King James Version, which is the Hebrew Masoretic, uh, where it's cleared up when we go to look at it in uh, the book of Jasher. 
And I say this, and get, please understand, it doesn't mean that everything in the book of Jasher I could say is 100%. I really don't know. I just know on that issue, it seems to help clarify what happens. So anyway, Potiphar's wife cast her eye on Joseph. We find this out in Genesis chapter 39, verses 2 to 7. And the Lord was with Joseph and was prosperous. He is a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw the Lord was with him, that the Lord made uh, all that uh, he did prosper in his hand, and Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him the overseer of his house, and all that he had put into his hand. And it came to pass at the time that he made him overseer in his house over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian house for the Joseph's sake, and the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and knew not uh, ought he had saved the bread which he did eat and Joseph was a goodly person and well favored and it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eye upon Joseph and she said lie with me this is where everything gets bad so Potiphar's wife falsely accuses Joseph as we know the story because he refuses to consent to her she presses him day after day after day uh, Jay sure very interesting the way it lays out that story there pretty much the same the only difference is in the story of Jay sure we find out that even the judges find that Joseph is innocent that's interesting in itself but anyway G Genesis 39 11 and it came to pass about that this time Joseph went into the house to do his business and there was none of the men in the house uh, there within and she caught him by his garment saying lie with me and he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out him and it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth that she called unto the men of the house and spake unto them saying see he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us he came in to me to lie with me and I cried with a loud voice and it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out and she laid up his garment by, uh, by her until uh, his Lord came home and she spake unto him according to these words saying the Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came unto me to mock me oh my gosh what a horrible thing that had happened to Joseph now we'll return to the book of Jasher to see there's something one incredible insight that I want you to receive that, that actually is an insight that has been recorded by David himself in the book of Psalms Potiphar has Joseph beaten by the way for the crime he is falsely accused of sleeping with his wife and Yeshua was beaten as we know for the crime he did not commit either Yeshua would not sleep with the whore of Babylon see now notice that that's one of the incredible things I saw in this story right here something I'd never even thought about before when we look at Potiphar Potiphar's wife represents the whore of Babylon just like the whore of Babylon today Rome see Yeshua you know, when they said that Yeshua was the king of Israel, that he would raise up the king, but all the, all, notice all the rabbis during Yeshua's day, they said, we have no king but Caesar. What is it? I mean, what was it with the rabbis then? Just like it is today. They're all out there sleeping amongst the whore of Babylon. See, Yeshua would not sleep with Rome. But Yeshua also, when he came to set up, he was, he was coming for his own kingdom. His kingdom was not of this world. He said, you, 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 my, my servants would fight for it if it was. See? So Rome is fighting for, for Jerusalem, but his kingdom is the new Jerusalem in another dimension. You understand? And Yeshua refused to sleep with Rome. But yet all of those rabbis of, of G Jesus' day, that's exactly what they were doing. When they cried out to, to, to Pilate, when he, when he was saying that Jesus was innocent, what did they say? Uh, Pilate says, I have nothing to do with this just man. I find no fault in him. And he says, if you do not condemn him, you're not a friend of Caesar. What, was the, what were they doing? They were sleeping. They were prostituting themselves to a bunch of Roman whores. It's exactly what they were doing. And they're doing it much the same way today. Think about that. See, Yeshua would not sleep with the whore of Babylon. Now, in Psalm chapter 8, verse 2, this was one of the most powerful evidences that I saw to me 
They let me know that the book of Jashur that we have today has got a lot of truth in it. And that doesn't mean that I say that everything in there is truth. I don't know. I really honestly don't know. All right? But when I saw this here, I knew that there was truth in that book regardless. Follow me here. Psalm 8, verse 2. Out of the mouth of babes and suckling hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. See, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. The enemy and the avenger. Watch what happens. This is according to the book of Jashur. I think this is chapter 42. I didn't note it here. I apologize. And while his Potiphar's men were beating Joseph, he continued to cry out and weep. That was Joseph. And there was a child there, 11-month-old child. It's Potiphar's son, by the way. And the Lord opened the mouth of the child. And he spake these words before Potiphar's men who were smiting Joseph, saying, What do you want of this man? And why do you do this evil unto him? My mother speaketh falsely and uttereth lies. Thus was the transaction. In other words, the boy says, Thus was the transaction. Now he's going to tell you what happened. And the child told them accurately all that happened, all the words of Zilka. By the way, that was Potiphar's wife's name, Zilka. To Joseph, day after day did he declare unto them. And all the men heard the words of the child, and they wondered greatly at the child's words. And the child ceased to speak and became still. And Potiphar was very much ashamed at the words of his son and commanded his men not to beat Joseph anymore. And the men ceased beating Joseph. A child, he stilled the enemy, which was an Egyptian, Pontifer, and the avenger. Or that could be, in this case here, the enemy, because Pontifer's wife is the true enemy. It stilled her. She represents the whore of Babylon and the avenger, her husband. Joseph placed in prison, as we know, Genesis 39, verse 19, it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servants to me that his wrath was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. Whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. He, kept, he oversaw everything in the prison. Now, by the way, as we know, Yeshua was also beaten falsely for something he never did. Falsely accused by both Jews and Romans. The butler has favor, but the baker is condemned. We all know this story. When Yeshua was there, there was both a butler and a baker that were thrown into prison because the, the Pharaoh of Egypt was angry with them. He places them in the prison. They'd been there for a year, and right about the time of the, of, uh, the Pharaoh of Egypt's birthday, they both had dreams. And Joseph sees that their countenance has changed. He comes to them, as we'll just save time here, and he interprets the dream of the butler and sees in there that he saw that, you know, that he has, you know, the blossoming of the, uh, the, of the branches and, the, and, and, the, and that it budded and blossomed and shot forth and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes and Pharaoh's cup was in, in my hand, he says, and I took the grapes and pressed them in the Pharaoh's cup and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Of course, Joseph interprets the dream and he speaks about how that the three branches are three days in which he will be restored back to his butlership, and he says, remember me when you come into favor of the king. Of course, the, 
The baker is all excited about the good news. He tells him his own dream there and ends up being that as the bird were eating the, the meat out of the basket that he said the three baskets are three days also and Pharaoh will lift you up too and you will be hung on a tree and the birds will eat the flesh off of your body. As I said before, we know that this is a beautiful type of where Yeshua himself, when we see in the story in the book of Luke, um, and he speaks about that he has two thieves that are, that, are, that are hung with him. One doesn't make it. One condemns Yeshua, just like the baker. He didn't, didn't like what Joseph had to say. But the other one, this is when they're all being there. They're saying that we get justly do our reward, our deeds by this man have done nothing. That's what the good man says about Yeshua. And he said to, unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I send to thee today, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. That was the type of the butler. But of course, the butler did forget Joseph while he was there. Um, and then he spake to the chief butler and Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. This is after three more years passed by. Or, I'm sorry, two more years passed by, I believe it is. Joseph still remained inside the prison. And now the, the Pharaoh of Egypt has now had dreams. And he has two dreams back to back. And it appears to be as two different dreams, but of course Joseph is going to tell him it's only one dream, one and the same dream there. And as he dreams this thing, we know the story that the that Pharaoh is wanting to kill all the magicians and wise men of Egypt because they're all, none of them can interpret his dream. And of course, Jasher goes into more detail. Genesis just clearly says that they, that they could not interpret his dream, which is true. They could not interpret his dream, but what they were doing was giving him false interpretations. But the Pharaoh was wise enough to know that these were not true interpretations. That's so much like today. So many people try to interpret dreams, everything else, or have all kinds of dreams and visions. And if they don't like it, um, or if it doesn't come to pass, they just move on and do it all over again. And you have the same thing even in, well, I won't go there. I'll hold my tongue on that issue there anyway. So we find out what happens here with the butler and Pharaoh saying, I do remember my faults this day, the, the butler says, when he sees that the Pharaoh is about to kill all the wise men of Egypt. And he says, Pharaoh was wroth with his servants and put, put me in the ward and the captain of the guardhouse, both me and the chief baker. And we dream dreams in one night, and, and, and I and he, and he dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was there with this young man, a Hebrew servant of the captain of the guard. He told him and interpreted to us our dream to each man according to his dream. He did interpret. And it came to pass, he interpreted to us it was, and he restored unto mine office, and him he hanged, speaking of the butler." Now, moving on and down into Genesis in the story, Joseph said unto Pharaoh the dream, because he brings him out. They shave him quickly, bring him out before Pharaoh. Pharaoh tells him the dreams that he has. And then he goes like this. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. Remember the kind and also the, the stalks of corn that are growing and, and there's seven years of, or there, there's seven uh, kind and there's also seven stalks of ear and the first seven years they're great and wonderful the second seven are very lean and so that the seven seven lean ones eat up all that of the good right now watch what he says Joseph said unto Pharaoh the dream of Pharaoh is one God hath showed Pharaoh what he is about to do the seven good kind are seven years and the seven good ears are seven years the dream is one and the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years. And the seven empty ears of blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh, what God is about to show unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, and there shall arise after them seven years of famine. And all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land, and the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of that famine falling, for it shall be very grievous. And for that the dream was double unto Pharaoh twice, and it is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. That kind of makes me wonder if when people have dreams, I have seen this in my own life where people have exactly the same dream a second time. According to Joseph, it's to let you know it is established by God. 
Very interesting. Now, the seven, remember the seven, this is important. My Jewish brethren, listen closely here. The story of Joseph deals with the seven years of famine. We know in Daniel we have 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem to the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. That is 69 weeks, friends. 69 weeks. What does that leave us? One week. And that one week applies to Israel and Israel alone. It is also called sometimes the 70th week of Daniel. It is very similar to the seven years of famine that we saw in Egypt. And by the way, this is when God begins to deal with Joseph's brothers. Is during that 70th week. Okay? Because it applies to Israel. And this is when Joseph deals with his brother. Is during that 70th week. Notice. Another interesting point on this. Moreover the Lord. This is in Isaiah chapter 30 verse 26. The light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun. And the light of the sun shall be sevenfold. As the light of seven days. In that day, remember it's only a week, the 70th week, seven days, the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people and healeth the stroke of their wound. I can't help but believe that Yeshua was cut off in the midst of the week. There's your 70th week. See, the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people. See, the, 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 the dealing with the sin has already been dealt with, but the reconciliation of iniquity has not been resolved, Israel. It's not been resolved. There's got to be a reconciliation. Look at the Hebrew words there. To reconcile, to bring you back to what the iniquity is to go off the path, go off course. It's to bring you back to the true word of God healeth the stroke of their wound. Does it not say in Zechariah, we will look upon him whom we have thrust through? I know that it was the Romans that drove the spear into his side. I know it was the Romans that drove the nails into his hands. But do you not know that God, according to Zechariah's prophecy, holds our people responsible? It says they will look upon him whom they have thrust through. And some say, well, that's the Romans, Brother Steve. That has nothing to do with the Jews. That was not the Jews that did that. Then why does it mention the house of Nathan, the house of David, the house of Shemai, the house of Levi, and even the Samaritans, those families that remained? Shemai is a Benjamite. David and Nathan were the tribe of Judah. Why is it the house of Judah is brought home and so it doesn't lift up against the house of Israel? To heal at the stroke of their wound. A stroke. They struck Yeshua. And God has held it to our charge. Even though our hands, as it was in the case of Joseph, the hands of our brothers of his own brethren, they only took the money. They didn't actually do the dirty work. But God reckons it unto their hands. Let's look at more of this, my friends. All right. Notice. In Daniel 9.25, it says, The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. It shall be built again with the broad place and a moat. That's another way to word the same, same sentence there. In Hebrew it says, Tashuf binata In other words, the time is going to return. See, something is going to return and they're going to construct a road and a wall. No, it's not the word kir. Kir, kir is, is the word wall. It's a different word used there. The charutz 
is a little different there. A moat, whatever it may be. What has bothered me about this verse here, though, we are looking for the building of the third temple. And I have searched the scripture to find out why does it only speak of one street? Why it says the street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. And everybody has been applying this back during the time when Israel first come home after the 70, after, after Israel had been in captivity by the Babylonians. According to this, this is done after the 69th week. This is when this street is built. Why only one street? When it speaks about the 70 weeks are determined upon thy people to, 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 to build Jerusalem and, the, and, 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 and rebuild all of that, that's at the beginning of the 70th week. That has nothing to do with, with after the 69th week and the 70th week. There's something going to happen in the 70th week and it's only going to be a street and a wall built. Is it going to be that they're going to start the temple but not finish it? All right? Look what it says right here. Another, another scripture here to give you an idea for the word for Rechov here, the broad place. And all the people said in the broad place before the house of God. All right, now, that's only giving you an idea there. Now, it troubled me so much when I saw this, it was obvious to me, Tashuv means you're going to return. That's speaking of the people of Israel. They're going to return, and they're going to construct a street. Only one street, not a bunch of streets, not all the streets of Jerusalem. It has nothing to do with modern-day Israel, but there's something to do in the 70th week they're going to construct. Now, we know according to Revelation 11, Measure the temple, measure the altar, but leave out the outer corpus given unto the Gentiles. This is the blueprints. This is the plans for the third temple to be built. Now, you guys, maybe you know something that I don't know, but there's something about this. There's only going to be a, there's only going to be a wall and a street built. I wondered at one time, could it have anything to do with the Kotel? Because they, they cleared out all the, uh, the, the, the Arab houses that were there, and, and the wall was uncovered some. But it says, no, it says they're going to return. What? See, it's a, now, oh gosh. So I knew something happens after the 69th week. It's a sign to us. Something is going to happen in Jerusalem about building a street and a wall. Maybe they're meaning to build the temple, but they just don't get it complete. I don't know. Well, let's look at what the Septuagint says. That, that's what really got my attention. If it means after the 69th week this is going to happen, then what did the Septuagint have to say? Well, it says, And thou shalt know and understand that from the going forth of the command of the ant, and for the answer and for the building of Jerusalem until Christ, the prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. That's just for building of Jerusalem and for the coming of Yeshua. Right? Then the time shall return, it says in the Septuagint, and the street shall be built and the wall and times shall be exhausted. In other words, the 70th week is over. And all they get is built as a street and a wall. Something's going to happen, friends, in the very near future. I would watch for that. Let's get back on track here. Genesis 41, 47. In the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls, and they gathered all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt. And they laid up the food in the cities, the food of the field, which was round about every city, and laid it he up in the same. And Joseph gathered corn in the sand of the sea very much until he left numbering, and it was so was just without number. Reminds me, reminds me of the children of Israel. They would be like the sand of the sea. Is that not a type of Joseph, Yeshua, gathering in his people? Does he not type in the harvest as bringing in the grain to the garner? You're seeing Joseph. You're seeing Jesus. When you see Joseph, you see Jesus. Everything is there. Yeshua, our deliverer, our salvation. See, Joseph fed the world first. Then Israel returned home last. That's another thing I noticed as well. The gospel, after, after the Jewish brethren were cut off, they rejected their Messiah. Yes, there were early, all the early believers were Jewish. I, be, I believe that. I agree with that. And I know that. But the nation of Jews, they were scattered to the four corners of the earth. And here it was, Joseph was feeding the world, the Gentiles. All the Gentile world came and got corn first. Then comes the children of Israel to buy corn. Watch what it says here. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph. 
what he saith to you do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened up all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians, and the famine waxed sore in the land, and all the countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn, because the famine was so sore in all the land. And so all Israel shall be saved. We know that as well. Romans eleven twenty five. 25, For behold, I will not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So Joseph had to feed the rest of the world first. It's the same thing with Yeshua. The gospel has gone to the entire world first, but Joseph's brethren are coming home. Right? So all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And for this is my covenant of them when I shall take away their sins. See? The reconciliation for iniquity has not been completed now. Let's go back to the book of Jasher and look at this. Joseph watching for his brothers. He knew they were coming. Chapter 52, verse 32. Joseph knew. We're getting close to the end, friends knew that his brethren also would come to Egypt to buy corn. For the famine prevailed throughout the earth, and Joseph commanded all his people that they should cause it to be proclaimed throughout the land of Egypt, saying, And Joseph placed sentinels at the gates of Egypt and commanded them, saying, Any person who may come to buy corn, suffer him not to enter in till his name and the name of his father and the name of his father's father be written down. Whatever is written by day, send their names unto me in the evening that I may know their names. And Joseph did all these things, made these statutes, in order that he might know when his brethren should come to Egypt to buy corn. And Joseph's people caused it daily to be proclaimed in Egypt according to these words and statutes which Joseph had commanded. All right? Now, Jasher chapter 51. And it's important to note, in Genesis, we never really understand why Joseph considered them spies. Remember that how in Genesis, they were always looking at Joseph's brothers as spies? I think that's actually chapter 52. So if you happen to read it and I get the chapter wrong, please forgive me. I, so much I was dealing with there, I may have made that mistake, and I apologize if I did. Anyway, you're going to find out now why he considered them spies. Because we see that. He says that you're spies to seek out for the land. But nobody never, I never really realized why did he call them spies. Okay. Watch. You actually, in Jasher, you find out why. Behold, I hear that there is corn in Egypt. This is what Joseph, uh, Jacob says to his sons. And all the people of the earth go there to purchase. Now, therefore, why will you show yourselves satisfied before the whole earth? Go you also down into Egypt to buy us a little corn amongst those that come there. That, that we may not die. Same thing with Israel today. They, they make it look as if everything's okay. Now, they know they're dealing with a lot of chaos, but it's not okay. They still need Joseph. They need Yeshua's help. And Jacob, their father, commanded them, saying, When you come into the city, do not enter together in one gate on account of the inhabitants of the land. He was concerned about it. And while the sons of Jacob were going on, we skip verse 5, going on the road, they repented of what they had done to Joseph. And they spoke to each other saying, We know that our brother Joseph went down to Egypt. Now we will seek him where we go. And if we find him, we will take him from his master for a ransom. And if not by force, then we will die for him. They're, really, they're, they're beginning to get concerned about what happened now. And the sons of Jacob agreed to this thing and strengthened themselves on account of Joseph to deliver him from the hand of his master. And the sons of Jacob went to Egypt, and when they came near to Egypt, they separated from each other, and they came through the ten gates of Egypt. And the gatekeepers wrote their names on that day and brought them to Joseph in the evening. You don't think that Yeshua, that he doesn't know that Israel is in their homeland? Sure he does. And Joseph read the names from the hand of the gatekeepers of the city, and he found that his brethren had entered in the ten gates of the city. And Joseph at that time demanded that it should be proclaimed throughout the land of Egypt, saying, Go forth, all ye store guards, close all the corn stores, and let everyone 
only and let only one remain open that those come may purchase from it. And when the sons, skip down to verse 12, and when the sons of Jacob came into the city, they joined together in the city to seek Joseph before they bought themselves corn. And they went to the walls of the harlots. And they saw Joseph in the walls of the harlots for three days. For they thought Joseph would come in the walls of the harlots, for Joseph was very comely and well favored. And the sons of Jacob sought Joseph for three days. And they could not find him. And the man who was set over the open store sought for those names which Joseph had given him. And he did not find them. My friends, when I read this, I was so troubled. And I knew that this story of Jasher here was true. You remember in Revelation 18, 4, where it says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. Let's read on in Jasher. And the man who was set over the open store sought for those names which Joseph had given him, and he did not find them. And he sent to Joseph, saying, Three days have passed, and those men whose names thou didst give unto me have not come. And Joseph sent servants to seek the men in all Egypt and to bring them before Joseph. Did not God say that he would send out the reapers and the fishers after Israel? And he would fish for them, the hunters, and he would hunt for them. God has been hunting for you, Israel. And it's Yeshua that's sending out these ones to hunt for you. But why have you gone down to a harlot's house to look for him? Why has Israel gone to a whorehouse to look for the Mashiach? And Joseph's servants went and came into Egypt and could not find them and went down to Goshen and they were not there and then went to the city of Ramesses and could not find them. And Joseph continued to send 16 servants to seek his brethren and they went and spread themselves into the four corners of the city. Did he not say he would send the angels to the four corners of the earth and gather you together? It's Yeshua that's gathering you. And four of servants went into the house, and four of the servants went into the house of the harlots. And they found ten men there seeking their brother. Where did they find Israel? In the house of the harlot. For the servants went into the house of the harlots seeking and they found ten men there seeking their brother. The whore of Babylon. She has harlot for daughters. And the Jews are looking for the Messiah amongst the harlots. The mother of harlots, the Roman Catholic Church. By the way, Islam is one of their harlots. And you're seeking for Joseph, for your Mashiach among the harlots. He's not there. That's not where you look for the Messiah. Even this man here, 
According to Revelation 17, 5, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. All these evangelical churches like Kenneth Copeland and all the rest of them that have gone back to Mother Rome and declaring her to be their mother. According to Revelation 17, 5, are harlots. And they claim that this man right here, Adnan Akhtar, which prominent rabbis have gone to see this man because he's for the building of the third temple, but yet claims himself to be the Mahdi. And recently, Sanhedrin rabbis, they said, if the Mahdi were the Mashiach, we will accept him. You're looking in the harlot houses for the Mashiach. You are fulfilling the biblical prophecy that was written, written about Joseph, a type of Yeshua, he's not in a whorehouse. Jasher chapter 52, and Joseph spoke to them, saying, From whence come ye? And they all answered and said, Thy servants have come from the land of Canaan to buy corn. For the famine prevails throughout the earth, and thy servants heard that there was corn in Egypt, and so the, they have come amongst the other Comers to buy corn for their support. And Joseph answered them and saying, If you have come to purchase as you say, why do you come through ten gates of the city? It can only be that you have come to spy through the land. Now Joseph, Jacob actually commanded them to do this. But it made them look like spies. They were looking for their brother though. Do you realize the love? Do you not know that Yeshua sees you looking for him? This is why he wrote in his word a 2,000 years earlier, Come out of her, my people, and be not partaker of her sins, her plagues. He's not among them. You'll never find the Mashiach among the Islam. You won't find the Mashiach among the evangelical. Not to say that they're not true believers among these people that love the Lord and know the Messiah, but the system itself is corrupt and it's a prostitute, a harlot system that has been birthed by the whore, by the great Babylon of Rome. Revelation 18.4 And they all together answered Joseph and said, Not so, my Lord. We are right. Thy servants are not spies, but we have come to buy corn. For thy servants are all brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And our father commanded us, saying, When you come to the city, do not enter together at one gate on account of the inhabitants of the land. They told the truth there. Luke 2.7 and, and, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in a swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room there in the end. Now you're going to see some more types here. Because what happens? We know in the story of Genesis here as he finally accepts them. Now notice he actually put them in prison for three days. And he lets them out. You know what that three days in that prison represented? Remember over in Hosea? See, Hosea, the prophecy there. God said, I'm going to leave them. This is all the way back during the time of the house of Israel when they went into captivity. God said, I'll hide my face from them. That's what Joseph did. He hid his face from Israel, from his own brethren. He said, until they acknowledge, let me, let me. What did Hosea say? Let's go to verse, chapter 5, verse 15. I will go and return to my place. This is the Lord speaking. Till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they, should, they will seek me early. Isn't that what Joseph's brothers were doing? They were repenting and they were seeking his face a little bit early. Come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, he will heal us. He hath smitten, that's chapter 6, verse 1, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us, and the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Joseph put him in prison for three days, and at the third, at the, on the third day there he let him out of the prison. But then he binds Simon, 
Shimon, as we say in Hebrew, one who hears. They bound, Joseph bound him up. In other words, bound his hearing. They have eyes and can see and ears and cannot hear. Remember the, the prophecy? Anyway, he tells them, give ass to their provender. Uh, anyway, as, he, he, as they're going back, he puts their, their money back into their sacks. Try to save a little bit of time here. Put some money back in their sacks. They depart. And as they're going along, they stop Genesis uh, 42, 27. And as one of them opened up his sack, give, give his ass or his donkey provender in the end, he espied his money for behold, it was in his sack's mouth. And they were greatly afraid. Again, my Jew Jewish brethren, it's a sign to us because the first place we rejected Yeshua was when he was in the womb of his own mother and there was no place found for him in the inn and he ended up having to be born in a stable. Of course, he was the Lamb of God. Lambs of God are born in stables, aren't they? Well, it's the same thing right here. He gave, he gave him provender and that's when he found his money. Taking you back where you messed up at Genesis 43, 19, and they came near to the steward of Joseph's house. They've come back now. This is after all that time. They came back. Their father sends them back. This time they bring Benjamin with them. They came near to the steward of Joseph's house, and they communed with him at the door of the house and said, Oh, sir, we came indeed down at the first time to buy, buy food, and it came to pass when we came to the inn that we opened our sacks, and behold, every man's money was found in the mouth of his sack. Of course, he finds favor <laughs> the steward knows that that happened. He lets them know, be at peace for you. Fear not. Your God and the God of your father have given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. And he brought Simon out unto them. You see, the thing is, is you cannot buy. You cannot, you can't pay for your sins. Not like that. It's a gift of God. And by the way, that money twice goes back into their sacks. You want to know why? Because they sold Joseph out and because you sold out Yeshua. Benjamin is with his brothers, but Jasher notes a fascinating incident that bears close resemblance of the wise men. That's something else I wanted to share with you guys. Let me, let's look at that there. If you look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, now when Yeshua was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Now we know the story of the wise men. The wise men were able to find Yeshua and go right to the very place he was born. How were they able to do it? They followed the stars, or a star, as we have heard it be said as well, this is something that came very interesting to me when I read this part in the book of Jasher. Now, I can't say it is true or not true. I don't know the answer to that. But when I look at the story of the wise men and knowing they were trained under Daniel, a trade that was passed down from the Hebrew generation, it made me wonder this may very well be true. Watch what it says here. Verse 18, And he ordered them to bring before him his map of the stars, whereby Joseph knew all the times. And Joseph said unto Benjamin, because they brought him down. They're, they're, they're there. They, they're meeting with their brother. He's invited them over to have dinner with them at noontime. And Benjamin, he comes and sits up there with him. And he asks him, he says, I've heard that the Hebrews are acquainted with all wisdom. Dost thou know anything of this? And Benjamin said, Thy servant is knowing also in the wisdom which my father taught me. And Joseph said unto Benjamin, Look now on this instrument and understand where thy brother Joseph is in Egypt who you said went down to Egypt. Because you see, only their father said he was tore by, torn by a wild beast. Joseph's brethren knew that he was not. And so they would say perhaps he went into Egypt. And Benjamin beheld the instrument that the, uh, with the map of stars of heaven, and he was wise and looked therein to know where his brother was. And Benjamin divided the whole land of Egypt into four divisions, and he found that he was sitting upon the throne before him was his brother Joseph. And Benjamin wondered greatly. And when Joseph saw that his brother Benjamin was so much astonished, he said to Benjamin, What hast thou seen, and why art thou astonished? And Benjamin said unto Joseph, I can see that by this that Joseph my brother sitteth here with me upon the throne. And Joseph said unto him, I am Joseph thy brethren. Reveal not this thing unto thy brethren. Behold, I will send thee with them when they go away. 
and I will command them to bring, bring back again into the city, and I will take thee away from them. We find out according to Jasher, Jasher wanted to see if they had repented of their sins yet. Thou Israel is innocent like Benjamin, the cup is in their bag. That's something else I want to just mention to you quickly, guys. In Genesis, we find out that, that, that Joseph, when he goes to send them on their way, he puts his cup in Benjamin's bag, brother that was innocent. Sends them out, puts their money back, gives them all their corn. As we know the story, they're captured again by the servant, brings them back, accuses them of, of being thieves. And they said, whoever ends up being the one with the, with, the, with the cup, he shall become my slave, the rest of y'all set free. They're not expecting it to be in Benjamin's bag. But of course, when they find it there, they all begin to, to tear their clothes. They begin to weep before the Lord. Cannot believe that this has happened. The book of Jasher tells the story a little bit differently than what we're used to. And it shows that where Judah and Simon are willing to fight for Benjamin, something they never did for Joseph. And this is what Joseph wanted to see. He figured if they were willing to fight and die for Benjamin, that they had truly repented. Let's read these final words here in closing in Jasher, Jasher chapter 54, starting with verse 14. Now, therefore, go your way to your father, and your brother shall be unto me for a slave, for he has, he has robbed the king's house. And Judah said, What is it to thee? Or to the character of the king. Surely the king sendeth forth from his house throughout the land silver and gold, either in gifts or expenses. And thou still talkest about thy cup, which thou didst place in our brother's bag, and sayest that, that he has stolen it from thee? They knew that it wasn't like Benjamin to do it. He said, God forbid that our brother Benjamin or any of the seed of Abraham should do this thing to steal from thee or from anyone else, whether king, prince, or any man. Now, therefore, cease this accusation, lest the whole earth hear the word saying, for a little silver, the king of Egypt wrangled with the men and accused them and took their brother for a slave. This is what Judah is saying to Joseph. And Joseph answered and said, Take unto you this cup and go from me. Leave your brother for a slave, for it is the judgment of the thief to be a slave. And Joseph answered and said, Why do you forsake your brother and sell him for twenty... Now Joseph says to them, Why did you forsake your brother and sell him for twenty pieces of silver? Unto this day, and why then will you not do the same to this your brother? I'm, I just wonder, why didn't they catch on to this right off? And Judah said, The Lord is witness between me and thee, that we desire not thy battles. Now therefore give us our brother, and we will go, with, with, go without quarreling with you. And Joseph answered and said, If all the kings of the land should assemble, they, they will not be able to take your brother from my hand. And Judah said, what shall we say unto our father when he seeth that our brother cometh not with us and will grieve over him? And Joseph answered and said, This is the thing which you shall tell your father, say, saying, The rope has gone after the bucket. And Judah said, Surely thou art a king, and why speakest thou these things, giving a false judgment? Woe unto the king who is like unto thee, and Judah answered and, and answered Joseph, saying, Surely thou must know that I was security for the lad to his father, saying, If I brought him not unto him, I should bear his blame forever. Therefore I have approached thee from amongst all my brethren. For I saw that thou wast unwilling to suffer him to go from thee. Now therefore may I find grace in thy sight that thou shalt send him to go with us. And behold, I will remain as a substitute for him to serve thee in whatever thou desirest. For wherever soever thou shalt send, I will go to serve thee with great energy. Now he was talking about even doing wars for him. Dost thou not know or hast thou not heard that our father Abraham with his servant Eliezer smote all the kings of Elam? With all the host in one night, they left not one remaining. And ever since that day, our father's strength was given unto us for an inheritance for us and our seed forever. And Joseph answered and said, You speak truth, and falsehood is not in your mouth. For it was also told unto us that the Hebrews have power, and that the Lord their God delighteth much in them, and who that can stand before them. However, on this condition will I send your brother, if you will bring before me, his brother, the son of his mother, of whom you said that he had gone from, 
from you down to Egypt and shall come to pass when you bring unto me his brother, I will take him in his stead. Because not one of you was security for him to your father. When he shall come unto me, I then will send with you his brother for whom you have been security. This is getting interesting. We're closing now. One more frame. And Simon answered Joseph saying, did we not tell thee, um, and by the way, we're skipping in verses here and there because it's very long. Did we not tell thee at the first that we knew not the particular spot to which he went? Speaking of Joseph, they didn't know where he went. And whether he, had, whether he be dead or alive, wherefore speaketh my Lord like uh, unto these things? And Joseph, observing the countenance of Judas, discerned that his anger began to kindle when he spoke unto him, saying, Bring unto me your other brother instead of this brother. Speaking of Benjamin. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Surely you said, that your brother was either dead or lost. Now, if I should call him, Joseph says, if I should call him this day, he should come before you, would you give him instead of the other brother? In other words, would you give Joseph instead of Benjamin? If he call, he's going to call Joseph for him. And Joseph began to speak and call out, Joseph, Joseph, come this day before me and appear to thy brethren and sit before them. And when Joseph spoke this thing before them, they looked each a different way to see from whence Joseph would come before them. Remember, they had come to the city hoping they would find him. And Joseph observed all their acts and said to them, Why do you look here and there? I am Joseph whom you sold into Egypt. Now, therefore, let it not grieve you that you sold me. For as a support during the famine did God send me before you. And his brethren were terrified at him when they heard the words of Joseph. And Judah was exceedingly terrified at him. And when Benjamin heard of the words of Joseph, he was before them in the inner part of the house. And Benjamin ran unto Joseph, his brother, and embraced him and fell upon his neck. And they wept. And they all embraced him and wept. Zechariah chapter 12, my Jewish brethren, is about to come to pass. Looking upon him whom you pierced, who you sold. He's not in the whorehouse. So why do you keep looking, my brothers? He's not in a harlot's house. He's right before you. He's in your midst. He's the one that is answering your prayers. But we know what Israel is going through is not easy right now. It wasn't easy for Joseph's brethren. All the way up to the very moment he revealed himself to them, it was a trial and a tribulation for them. But you're looking in the wrong place. Everything you're doing is prophesied of. Everything you're doing has been prophesied of. Look at the story of Joseph and you will find the Mashiach. I'm Stephen Benoon, your brother. I found him in the story of Joseph. Shalom.